But I don't suppose there's any of us here that aren't sorry for something that we've done in our lives and are so thankful that there is forgiveness with God. How many times I remember and think back to yesterday Before I turned my back on you and went the other way Your blessings they make rich no sorrows do you add But I risked it all that day And sorrows is all I have Don't you know I'm sorry, Lord My heart is breaking inside Don't you know I'm sorry, Lord, I just want to run and hide. Forgive me, oh God, forgive me, oh God, oh God, forgive me.
it's too high, the pain too great to family and to friends. At the entrance to this way, the sign forever stands. Fools and fools alone enter into this land. Don't you know I'm sorry, Lord? My heart is breaking inside. Don't you know I'm sorry, Lord? I just want to run and hide. Forgive me, oh God. Forgive me, oh God. Don't you know I'm sorry, Lord? My heart is breaking inside. Don't you know I'm sorry, Lord? I just want to run and hide. Forgive me, oh God. Forgive me, oh God. Oh God, forgive me. Good morning. God bless you. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Our God and our Father, we thank thee so and praise thee for the salvation that you have provided for us by grace, through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us now as we open your word. Give us understanding, we pray, and obedient hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is David, David the shepherd king, the day of consequence, the day of consequence. We left Saul eating his last supper, uh, which was prepared by a witch, the medium of Endor. God had allowed Saul to have communication with the physically dead, yet still living Samuel. And Samuel spoke to Saul about Saul's present, his past, and his future. As to Saul's present, Samuel prophesied the inverse of Romans 8.31. If God be for us, who can be against us? But for Saul, it was, if God be against us, who can be for us? Then Samuel reminded Saul that sowing and reaping were a fundamental part of the ways of God. May we all take note. God had given Saul victory over the Amalekites, but Saul had disobeyed the Lord in not judging King Agag. And that disobedience summarized the whole history of Saul's kingship. And finally, Samuel prophesied regarding Saul's future. In tomorrow's battle, God would give victory to the Philistines over Israel, and Saul and his sons will die. But the Word of God does not tell us of Saul's response. There's no indication that he sought to make peace with God, or his son, Jonathan, or David. Samuel's words to Saul are characterized by the same hopelessness communicated to the physically dead yet still living rich man in his conversation with Abraham in Luke chapter 16. Though we call him the rich man, there is none poorer than he. And though we would say he was living, the word of God teaches that if a man dies in his sins, he is eternally dead. Though forever existing, but not living. In other words, God does not call living without him life. The men and women in this world who are without Christ are dead in their sins, John 8, 24 and Ephesians 2, 1. And if they die in their sins, they shall face the second death in the lake of fire, Revelation 20, 14 and 15. Sinners, beware. The rich man was looking for help and lessening of the agony of his eternal sentence of judgment. But he looks to Abraham for help and not to God. He had not looked to God when he lived, and in Hades, he still did not look to him. 
Luke 16, 24 and 25. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. The rich man was already rejected by God. And so he called upon Abraham. Likewise, Saul was already rejected by God. And so he called upon Samuel. But both the rich man and Saul found that if you die without Christ, there is no good news from the other side of the grave. Only outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, 30. What if you or I were suddenly stricken with a massive heart attack and had only 24 hours to live? How would we respond? Would our first thought be to be sure that we were right with God? Would we begin negotiating with God as King Hezekiah in hopes that God might give us more time? Will we call family together for a last goodbye? Would we have a solid peace at the prospect of leaving this world? There is a sense that all of life is about preparation for death. Think about it. What is a life of 80 years in light of forever? And forever starts at death. And yet here is a great temptation for all of us to think upon these 80 years as if these years are our forever. Psalm 49, 11, their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. But how deceived they are, verse 14. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them and their beauty shall consume in the grave far from their dwelling. The Apostle James gives us the only right perspective when contrasting our 80 years with eternity. James 4, 14, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. But God has placed eternity in the hearts of men and women, Ecclesiastes 3, 11. There is a sense of eternity within all our hearts. And this is evidence in our fervent desire to extend the years of our lives and our persistent search for the fountain of youth. Actually, there is a fountain of youth about 30 miles from here, but it's an RV park. But for Solomon, because he possessed the highest of this world's wisdom, the shadow of death continually haunted him. He saw the pale of death upon everything in this life. Solomon understood the grave as the common denominator that equalized all men. And this bleak realization drained Solomon of hope. Death was his ultimate end, and he could not escape the finality of it. Though he was a king with majestic glory, possessing greatness of wisdom, and having such magnificent accomplishments that he could amazingly say, For what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath already been done? Ecclesiastes 2.12 And yet he saw that he would die the same death as the fool. Ecclesiastes 2.14, the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. Then said I in my heart, as it, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I even more wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man? As the fool. Therefore I hated life, 
because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Solomon hated life because he saw that he could make no real progress because of the inevitability of death. We could only wonder if this shadow of death and its accompanying vexation of spirit brought such discouragement upon Solomon that it obscured his vision of faith and hastened his departure from the Lord. One thing is for sure, Solomon certainly did not end well. In any event, Saul's departure from the Lord was not hastened by an obscured vision of faith, for he had no faith. So we leave the faithless and hopeless Saul on the night before his sad death to revisit David. And no doubt David didn't sleep any better uh, on this night than Saul, because tomorrow, for them both, is the day of consequence, or as we say, payday. For the compromised David, tomorrow's outcome is a most uncertain one. He must either fight with the Philistines against his own people Israel, or stand in opposition to Achish, the Philistine king who had befriended him and who had even determined to trust him as his bodyguard in tomorrow's battle. 1 Samuel 29, 1 through 5. Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Abek, and the Israelites pitched by a fountain which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines passed on by hundreds and by thousands, but David and his men passed on in the rear reward with Achish. Then said the princes of the Philistines, What do these Hebrews hear? And Achish said unto the princes of the Philistines, Is not this David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, which hath been with me these days or these years? And I have found no fault in him since he fell unto me unto this day. And the princes of the Philistines were wroth with him. And the princes of the Philistines said unto him, Make this fellow return, that he may go again to his place which thou hast appointed him. And let him not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he be an adversary to us. For wherewith should he be reconciled unto his master? Should it not be with the heads of these men? Is not this David? of whom they sang one to another in dances, saying, Saul slew his thousands, and David his ten thousands? Sir Walter Scott's famous statement bears repeating, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. And Brother William Secker makes a most germane point. If you hold the stirrup for him, no wonder if Satan gets into the saddle. David had indeed become entangled in a twisted web of his weaving, and he has held the stirrup for the devil, who now sits in the saddle of David's position of leadership. How apt the often repeated truism. Sin will take you far further than you want to go. Sin will keep you far longer than you want to say. And sin will cost you far more than you would ever want to pay. Sadly, I know this firsthand. Perhaps some of you know it too. I trust we have learned spiritually profitable and unforgettable lessons from our miserable engagement with sin. And may those who have not known this shame and pain be kept far, far from it. Though Solomon did not follow his own counsel, it was nevertheless true. Proverbs 4.23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And an acronym for Bible, B-I-B-L-E, is basic instruction before leaving earth. David wrote a song which included the following words, Psalm 119.105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible is indeed basic instruction before leaving earth, but we need to walk in the light of it. And on this sleepless night, David no doubt wondered how he could have been so foolish to lean on his own understanding in fleeing from Saul into the country of the Philistines. David's own understanding had supplied no lamp for his feet, and no light for his path. 
and even further, the darkness of his self-willed choices have put the lives of all who followed him in very great peril. May every believer be warned. But praise God that he is faithful even when we are not. 2 Timothy 2, 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. During the time of the judges, Israel was often unfaithful and wandered from God. Their disobedience was the cause of the enemy's many victories over them. But each time, when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up a deliverer. Judges 3, 9, and 15. God is faithful, and he is faithful all the time. Glory. But as David tosses upon his bed, it is with the sure knowledge that the morning brings the day of consequence. And David knows he has no hiding place. He has sown the wind, and he will reap the whirlwind. Hosea 8, 7. But David is still a man of faith. Remember that he penned Psalm 34 in response to his previous failure before Achish when he feigned himself mad? Psalm 34, 4, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Though not in relation to his present trial, David will later pen these words, Psalm 32, 7, Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. And we read in Job 35, 10, God is my maker who give us songs in the night. In all this, we conclude that because of God's faithfulness, even in our failure, there is hope. There are songs of deliverance, even in the darkest night of failure. Years ago, in a season of compromise, I wrote a song in the night. It contained this bridge. I know you hold me by the hand, I know your love will make me stand. I know that I must trust you now in the darkness of the night. And I know that you will never change. And I know, Lord Jesus, you're always the same. And I know you're faithful to me even now. What grace and how undeserved. And now after a full year and four months in the land of the Philistines, 1 Samuel 27, 7, David's day of consequence has come. But how will God bring to pass David's deliverance? Will David himself rise up again with sling in hand? Will David's mighty men unite together to fight? No. There is no human skill nor power that can free David from this twisted web. God's deliverance arises from the enemy. It is the Philistine lords themselves that release the trapped David. Verse 3, Then said the princes of the Philistines, What do these Hebrews hear? What a humiliating question for David himself to consider. Indeed, what are the Hebrews doing here with the Philistines on a day of battle against Israel? And more, what was righteous Jehoshaphat doing fighting alongside wicked Ahab and helping him in battle? Or why was Jehoshaphat in a shipping business with Ahab's equally ungodly son Ahaziah? 2 Chronicles 18, 28, and 20, 35. And why did Lot marry a woman of Sodom? Genesis 19, 26. Why did Samson take a daughter of the Philistines to be his wife? Judges 14, 1. What was Peter doing with the servants of the high priest, warming himself at their fire? Luke 22, 55. And why will the Lord's own people be joined with Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, in the future, Revelation 18, 4. None of these unequal yokes ended well. An unequal yoke is never for the glory of God, and the teaching of Scripture could not be clear as to the sin of unequal yokes. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 17. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, 
saith the Lord. James 4.4 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So when there was no remedy for David, no solution to his plight, no excuse for his sin, the mercy of God found a way. It is most important for the believer to take note that if we find ourselves in failure, the sooner we repent and the more real our remorse, the lighter might be the stroke of the rod on the day of consequence. 1 Samuel 29, 6-8 Then Achish called David and said unto him, Surely, as the Lord liveth, thou hast been upright, and thy going out and thy coming in with me in the host is good in my sight. For I have not found evil in thee since the day of thy coming unto me unto this day. Nevertheless, the Lord's favor thee not. Wherefore now return and go in peace, that thou displease not the lords of the Philistines. And David said unto Achish, But what have I done? And what hast thou found in thy servant so long as I have been with thee unto this day, that I might not go fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Verse 9, And Achish answered and said to David, I know that thou art good in my sight as an angel of God. Notwithstanding, the princes of the Philistines have said, He shall not go up with us to battle. Wherefore, now rise up early in the morning with thy master's servants that are come with thee. As soon as ye be up early in the morning and have light, depart. So David is still playing the game of subterfuge. He pretends to be offended that he cannot stand along Achish in the battle. It seems that David has become friends with Achish. And David does not want to disappoint him. And herein lays the snare of an unequal yoke. The believer must surrender his or her integrity. David has been a year and four months together with the Philistine king. He has won the trust and the respect of Achish. And yet to continue the relationship, David must continue the lie. How many believers today have compromised their walk with Christ? How many are being dishonest with someone in their life because they know that if they stand for Christ, they risk losing the relationship or perhaps the employment? There are many unbelievers that are enjoyable to be with. They may be charming, witty, and even possess an outward righteousness. Consider the so-called rich young ruler. He was a good man at least when compared with other men. By his own profession, he had from his youth kept the commandments of God. The Lord Jesus looked upon him and loved him, Mark 10, 21. True, the Lord knew the sin and the covetousness of his heart and told him to sell his goods and to follow him. But the point is that a believer might spend time with this fellow and enjoy his company. However, when the Lord Jesus, who loved him, dealt with him regarding his sin of covetousness, the young man went away sad. Verse 22. And so it is with the believer. We are called to preach the gospel of Christ, that the Holy Spirit might convict men and women of their sin and their desperate need for the Savior. But the moment the believer forgets his calling as an ambassador for Christ, he is snared and has compromised his integrity. May we each be watchful. David's relationship with Achish began as a matter of convenience. Achish provided a hiding place for David from Saul. And after all, Achish was a king, and to be with him in his surroundings was pleasant. And so a relationship developed between David and Achish. But to use people is a sin. We are to honor all men and women and in genuine concern for their souls to share the love of Christ with them. And this David did not do. Achish knew no more of the God of Israel, the only true God, after a year and four months with David than he knew before he met him. What a tragedy. The Lord Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. Oh, what a faithful friend we have in Jesus. He hides nothing from us. 
Verse 15, I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. And the Lord Jesus gave everything, even sacrificing his own life for us. And herein is the perfection of friendship. Amen. But as we shall soon see, the day of consequence for David has been extended another three days. David has yet to sufficiently face the gravity of his offense. As we mentioned earlier, a believer should remember that the severity of God's discipline for sin may be softened by genuine tears of contrition. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. God most certainly respects every tear that flows from a, bro from a broken heart. A heart broken because of the dishonor and reproach our sin has brought upon the Lord's name. Psalm 51, 17. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Amen. Our God and our Father, we pray that we might be those that would be quick to turn back to thee if we've turned away. Perhaps someone listening now may need to turn back to thee, may need to repent in this very moment for something that they've done, maybe an unequal yoke, whatever it might be. Something has drawn them away. My friend, in this moment, turn back to Christ that you might enjoy fellowship again with him. He restoreth my soul. We thank thee, O God, for thy mercy and thy grace. In the wonderful and blessed name of our Lord Jesus, Amen. Amen.